the, the, the Western mentality. So there are things that maybe if I talk about them here, it's normal. But if I speak about them in the West, maybe it's not normal. But so, so you know those things more better than me. Uh, well, we have democracy here supposedly too. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's there is a limit there. <laughs> yeah, of course. So yeah. yeah, we should be good. You know, be open and mashallah. We want to benefit uh, from your insights and. This is exactly what we need, actually. Uh, the Muslim community in the West is to um, hear from, mashallah, scholars such as yourself, ulama, who are not, you know, polluted in the same way that things are here, unfortunately, in some parts of the Muslim American community. So this is why, this is exactly why we want to talk to you. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Okay, so we can uh, start. I'll just give an intro, inshallah, and uh, we'll get started. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Muslim Skeptic Live. Today, we have an extremely special guest, and we're very honored to have him here to speak with us and share his knowledge. Uh, we have Fadilat al-Sheikh Tukhtgur Hassan Katani. MashaAllah, Sheikh Hassan is originally from Thank Morocco you. and he currently resides there and Sheikh Hassan's father was a highly respected professor and diplomat and in fact Sheikh Hassan's entire lineage is full of many many great scholars MashaAllah. His lineage actually goes back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, Sheikh Hassan himself has studied throughout the Muslim world. He has numerous ijazat, he has numerous degrees, uh, we would have to spend a very long time to list them all and he has served in many scholarly bodies and has served uh, as the head of many scholarly bodies including the association of uh, the scholars of, of the Maghrib. Uh, so alhamdulillah, we have Sheikh Hassan with us. Welcome to Muslim Skeptic Live. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, I'm so fine. Alhamdulillah, I'm so glad to be with you, and I'm, I have the pleasure to uh, be this night with you, or this morning, or <laughs> different <laughs> place to another. <laughs> yeah, mashallah. So, Sheikh, you know, I would say uh, I'm not trying to, you know, break your back, but I would say that you are one of the um, very important political. Uh, figures in Morocco and your history uh, in Morocco and what you have experienced uh, in Morocco. So I'd say that um, this is something that many can benefit from, especially in the West, to hear your story, to get your insights and your nasiha. And you know, some of our audience might not be aware that you actually were arrested in 2003 and you were sentenced to 20 years in prison. Uh, alhamdulillah, you were able to uh, be released and pardoned uh, by the king in 2011. And um, so we want to get your insights into this. And you were called as the ideological uh, influence for a series of suicide bombings that happened in 2003. And can you please describe to us, you know, what happened in that time? Uh, how were you targeted? Why were you targeted? Just give us some of these uh, background details, if you would, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Well, actually, uh, when I uh, want to speak about uh, my uh, trail, if I can uh, call it, uh, I always uh, remember that uh, our beloved prophets, peace be upon them, and our uh, great scholars in the history, all of them had a type of trail. Uh, it's a mihna, if we can say, which means that it's a part of uh, the CV of anyone who wants to be honest and uh, serve uh, the, 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 the true word of God Almighty. So, you know, when our beloved Prophet وسلم, had the first revelation, he went to Waraqat ibn Nawfal, and Waraqa uh, said to him that this is the revelation that was revealed to Moses, peace be upon him, and I wish I was still young to help you and to support you when your uh, people are going to kick you out of your city. He says, are they going to kick me out of my city? 
So he said, yeah, no one comes with what you come with. Uh, he, and he doesn't have this, uh, this problem. I mean, people don't, uh, can't stand to, uh, to hear the, the, the true, the truth word. And, you know, uh, the prophets, peace be upon them, some of them were killed, some of them were imprisoned, some of them were uh, were beaten, some of them were abused, etc. We, we know all these things, and we know the stories of our imams, like uh, all the four imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, Imam Malik, Imam Shabir, Imam Ahmed, the great uh, descendants of our beloved Prophet, وسلم, most of them were were killed or scattered or imprisoned, you know. So actually, this is part of the the the, the word of uh, the part of the one who uh, who wants to be honest and serve uh, the word of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So therefore, what happened to me is that when the the the, the United States and the West wanted to invade Afghanistan, we were against that, and we said this is not fair to invade uh, an Islamic country and kill people and bomb them and uh, destroy uh, a, a peaceful land. And uh, we were against that and we said that we, we were against that. And then we went, we we wrote a fatwa, actually. We, we participated in a fatwa that was written by Moroccan scholars, which says uh, that uh, this is totally haram to stand with the United States and, and uh, help them kill and beat and invade an Islamic state. So uh, that did uh, please uh, a lot of people here and there. So they went creating some problems. The first time they said that I'm against the Maliki uh, jurisprudence. So they, when they interviewed me, uh, I said to them, actually, uh, are you scholars to, uh, to speak about uh, Maliki inter uh, 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 Maliki school or whatever or being or against the Maliki school then the, the other thing what does the country con uh, um, I mean consider the one who is against the Maliki school as uh, as against the law is there anything in the law that says if you don't follow some Maliki opinions that means you have to go to prison actually there's nothing like that so then they they went more than that, and they they went making a new film, and they said that I participated in a camp that was uh, uh, against the law and something like that. And actually, you know, they they imprisoned me, and then they went searching for an accuse, an acquisition. So actually, <clears throat> I wasn't captured for something that I had I, I I'd done. I mean, they didn't accuse me and then capture me. They captured me, and then they went searching for uh, an accuse. Therefore, after my prison, by nearly three months, there was this suicide bombing in Casablanca. So they said, okay, you are behind these types of, and they forgot about all things before that. So that, that means I was captured before the crime happened. So therefore I told them, do you have any proof that I'm, that I'm behind these suicide bombs? Actually these suicide bombs are against what I teach and against what I believe in, and I will, and I, I am all, totally against what happened. So therefore, after nearly seven years, they went making my my judgment again. So uh, because in the first time they said that there are some witnesses, I said to them, "Give get get me these witnesses. I want to see these witnesses so that they can wit they they can tell me that you said to us doing." So do so and so, or or they witnessed that I did, or I said, or whatever. They said, no, we won't get anybody. So the lawyers said, okay, this is not actually a just uh, uh, judgment. This is actually only a game. This is a film. So they they went away and they left me by myself. So I was the one who uh, defended myself. I gave a speech there, a long speech, and I said to the judge that, what you're doing is wrong, and you, and what you are doing is is against Moroccan scholars. You are abusing Moroccan scholars because when you accuse me to do takfir on Muslims, 
or to uh, claim that Muslims are, uh, are supposed to be killed or innocent people are supposed to be killed. You are abusing me and abusing all Moroccan scholars because I'm a member of Moroccan scholars. And you're abusing my family, who is, which is a respected family in Morocco. Uh, believe me that the judge couldn't even look at my eyes. He used to speak to me without looking at my face. He couldn't look at my face because he knew that he's he's just playing a film and playing a game. He's not he's not a, a, a just judge actually. So he judged he sentenced me to 20 years. And then when they repeated the the judgment again, I defended myself and I said to the judge, "Do you have any proof that I I said or I did or uh, this is was this is what this is what I deserve to be uh, in prison for. So they got all the so-called witnesses. All of them said, we never knew this guy until we entered prison. And we never heard from him anything uh, like that. We never heard from him that he told us kill people or uh, call them uh, that they are un-Muslims or non-Muslims or whatever, or kill innocent people or whatever. So therefore the judge, the second judge said, okay, maybe you said that inside your lectures i said i told him okay if i said that inside my lectures please prove that do you have any proof that i said that inside my lectures he said actually i don't have any proof <laughs> even though even though he's the day that he was going to uh to sentence me he couldn't even look at me and he was just uh, uh seeming as a tired person he started to uh, i mean look at it here and there and he said, uh, as he, he, he was just asking me to forgive him, something like that. My son, you know, uh, please just, I mean, it's so funny, actually. So I just looked at him. He said, okay, you have another 20 years as it is. We won't change it. We won't change it. It's 20 years, 20 years. And we didn't sentence you for something that you have done. We sentenced you for the whole file. That means anybody did anything in the world, you're responsible for it. <laughs> So actually, I was. I said, inna lillah, inna lillah, what am I going to say? So then the grace came from Allah, actually. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, so subhanAllah, this is um, just so shocking that they... And it's just because, what, you opposing a illegal, immoral occupation, killing of Muslims, and you're in opposition to this in Morocco, and they are doing this to you for that. So this shows exactly the hypocrisy of the West because they claim that they're pro-freedom of speech, pro-freedom uh, of assembly, you can express your political views, but what a lot of people in the West don't know is that, no, the US has this control grid and they use uh, different powers that they have around the world to punish and penalize. Uh, Muslims and other groups too that oppose the Western US imperial program uh, and so and, and there are also in the US in the West there have been many uh, scholars who were detained were deported were uh, put in prison for long periods of time but not to the same extent and brutality of, of scholars ulama, and others Muslims in the East and, and the non-West part of the world. So subhanAllah, this is, you, your case is one of the most blatant examples, actually, uh, of this kind of counter, the war on terror, quote unquote, counter extremism, countering violent extremism. You were kind of at the very beginning of it as well, uh, and served as kind of a precedent for this kind of operation. And, you know, that, 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 point aside I, I wasn't aware that you're three months in prison before the bombings actually took place which yeah. is <laughs> more ridiculous it, it is but um, the the thing with the bombings themselves they're very suspicious you know I'm you know I think that conspiracies are real I think that it's very strange that Muslims uh, are going to kill and you know attack other Muslims because the victims of this bombing are all Muslims. All Muslims. All Muslims. Yeah. Uh, and, and when we asked, when we asked the the the, the people or the, the ones that didn't die from this uh, these suicide bombing, we told them who was behind you, who sent you to do these things. They said we don't know. 
We don't know. We told them, well, actually, what you have, you did is something totally wrong. What is this? So until now, we are we always ask the, the, the government to tell us what who was behind what happened, because it's so fishy. It's so strange. And there are some, I mean, some things that show that there is something behind that. Because there were a lots of people arrested for the for that bomb for that bomb those bombings actually, maybe more than ten thousand people were arrested for that. So actually, it's something so, so strange. Yeah, that what I also stuck out to me stood out to me was the fact that um, some of the other locations that were bombed, uh, because a Jewish cemetery was bombed, and also a Jewish community center was bombed, but was empty. Um, those are places that no, there were no Jewish victims. Yeah. Uh, it was only Muslim. So that's strange. If you're trying to bomb people and you have this kind of terrorist intent, you want to cause maximum harm with a suicide bombing. Why are you suicide yeah. bombing a Jewish cemetery? It, it seems like very strange. Yeah, an old Jewish cemetery. It's old. It's even old. Yeah, so you're, you're not planning to do any, take any victims. You're only t killing Muslims, and this seems to be a red herring. So, Allahu Alam. But this is very similar to what we see in many Muslim countries. So, I'm not going to speculate about Morocco, but in many Muslim countries, you have certain intelligence agencies from Western governments or Israel that are operating to. Uh, do acts of terrorism and kill Muslims so as to get the native population to be against uh, any kind of political Islam, any kind of, uh, you know, quote unquote, Islamist movement, Islamic movement to get people to say, we hate political Islam, we hate these, you know, Wahhabis, quote unquote, Salafis, quote unquote, who are killing Muslims, they are so extreme. But it's not actually the Ulama who are doing this or encouraging this, it's actually intelligence agencies that are uh, doing these kinds of false flag operations. And this is documented by historians. It's not something that we're making up. This is documented time and time again in countries like Algeria uh, and elsewhere uh, throughout the Muslim world. So getting back to um, your time in prison, so how was that? Um, you know, I, again, you mentioned this is a kind of mehna, kind of persecution. Um, so how, how was that experience for you? Well, actually, I, uh, uh, I spent a good time because I tried to benefit from my time. I uh, read a lot of uh, interesting books, uh, encyclopedias, actually. I read... Uh, uh, I read uh, by Imam Thahabi, which is. Uh, Sorry, you broke up there. Can you repeat it? Which is 24 volumes, I think. And I read Majmur uh, Fatah ibn Taymiyyah, which is 32 volumes. And I read uh, lots of books on all types of aspects, alhamdulillah. And, the, and uh, the very interesting thing is that I specialized in. Uh, reading the Bible and the biblical studies, and I had the opportunity because I wasn't in one prison. I, I changed from a prison to another, and when I was in Casablanca, I, they put me in a place where there are a lots of Western people and uh, African people who most of them are either Christian or Jews. So I had they, uh, the, the, the situation there wasn't squeezed. It was open. So I had the time to dis to uh, study the Holy Quran in English with some friends there. Some of them were Muslim, some of them were um, Christians, some of them were Jews. And we used to share knowledge, to share uh, the, the biblical uh, narrations that, uh, ha that speak about the same stories of the Holy Quran and stuff like that. And I went so far to study Hebrew. I went studying Hebrew and I taught myself how to study Hebrew. And there were some Jews... Uh, with me in prison, so I used to tell them, "I'm going to read, and you just correct my type, my my reading." <laughs> <laughs> so that was very interesting, actually. That was very interesting, and uh, that gave me a lots of, uh, I mean, good information and uh, and a very interesting background. Yeah, for that one, mashallah, that's 
Very interesting. So then, uh, Marshall, you were released in 2011. So it's been about a decade now. And how did you kind of go back to your life? Mm -hmm. And alhamdulillah, how did you kind of readjust? And um, do you face any kind of other political pressure now that you're out? Well, actually, when I uh, when, when I came out, it was actually a surprise because uh, every time they used to tell us uh, when there is a holiday or something like that, that there might be a grace. And, and uh, there were some grace because actually we used to struggle inside the prison. We used to, uh, we had very uh, several hunger strikes and we used to ask uh, to demand for releasing us because we are innocents. We used to always say that we are innocent and we don't deserve to be in prison. We don't deserve to be accused to uh, by these uh, big sentences, uh, long years. So therefore, we used to expect that in any time they might release us because once we finished a big hunger strike that all prisoners, all of our brothers entered this hunger strike and the government discussed with us. And uh, I wrote a fatwa about uh, about uh, hunger strike and it's published. It's called Al-Jawab an an ishkal man haram al idrab that means the answer of the people who say that hunger strike is haram and i get i put in a lots of evidence it's on the it's on the you can just google it and you, you can find it mm -hmm. and I, I i mentioned a lots of evidence about hunger strike and stuff like that and uh, actually the government went discussing with us and they released nearly 300 of our of of our friends uh, from prison so we expected any time that they might call us but they didn't call us all of a sudden, once after the the Arabic Spring, after the Arabic Spring, actually, uh, my lawyer, one of my lawyers, he became the the, the minister of justice. <laughs> so when he, uh, yeah, he's from the. So when he became the minister of justice, he gave our names to the king. There was a there was a grace of al Maulid. So he gave our names to the king. So the king immediately released us, actually. So uh, they just called me. I was uh, busy. Uh, I was busy memorizing some verses of the Quran and stuff like that. So they told me that the, the director of the prison wants you. I said, may Allah, what happened? Why do, what does he want me? Is that something good or bad? He said, no, no, no. You won't see anything bad from us. You won't be harmed from us. So when I went to him, uh, he was so happy, he smiled in my face and he said, okay, you're released. <laughs> so I got surprised, I even didn't know what to do. <laughs> so therefore, then, <laughs> then I called my wife. I called my wife, so I told her uh, that I'm released now. She didn't take it seriously because it happened several times. So she said, okay, that's good. Then I told us, okay, I told her, okay, just come and pick me. So she shouted, she started yelling and shouting. <laughs> and <laughs> so it was actually a very... <laughs> she was angry with you? It was a beautiful you, day, she, actually. She thought you were tricking day. you? or what? Why no, no, no. <laughs> she started calling my my brother. She started calling my brother oh, okay. because she, she she got surprised. She did No, she wasn't shouting on me. Yeah. She started just, you know, yeah. she got surprised, actually. So... Uh, uh, so therefore, I went home and things changed. Actually, uh, I started people started coming home and greeting me, and it was a very it was a very very happy day. Actually, and therefore, I started to, trying to see the the new the new life. I tried I started seeing the new life, and I went uh, gradually back to my normal uh, life giving my work, my lectures and stuff like that. Of course, the main thing I had to do is to uh, see how to live, how to work, how to do. And I made my own business, you know, I have, uh, I have my uh, first, I used to work with an academy, an Islamic academy, uh, a Western Islamic academy in English. Uh, and then I made my own academy, which is Ibn Abdul Bar Academy. Yeah. So I'm, I, I believe that I'm, alhamdulillah, free because uh, I have my own job, I have my own things. And that's, that makes me more, uh, more comfortable in speaking, writing, saying whatever I want. Alhamdulillah, that's great. Alhamdulillah, yeah. 
And when you came out of prison, did you notice that society had changed a lot over there? Like, because you're always speaking against uh, kind of westernization and certain uh, negative aspects of Western culture coming into society. So had that, did you notice a mark, markable change and uh, in that eight years that you're gone? Yeah, because uh, when, they, uh, when they caught us, most of the scholars and the preachers and, uh, you know, uh, were afraid. Everybody was afraid. And uh, the whole situation, uh, they like, if I can say, they squeezed all of the, the, the people of Da'wah, all of the scholars, all of, and they, they gave us as an example, you want to speak loudly, you would go to prison 20 years or 30 years. So everybody started just saying whatever the, the government wants, or at least just uh, keeping silent. So this led to change the, the, situ the society. I mean, I found that a lot of things changed. I, and people became more westernized, more far from religion. And I, didn't, I wasn't happy about that. Although, on the other hand, I found that the country is modernized, in types of uh, buildings, streets, buildings, uh, trains, etc., all these things that are, I mean, lifestyle, but they became back in in religion and all these types of uh, in, important things. So therefore, uh, and the other thing that was uh, normal that my my family were all. I was afraid that I would go back uh, to the same, uh, I would fall in the same problem. So therefore they were, they, I mean, they were always afraid. If you say something, they say, oh, just keep silent, just keep, uh, I mean, don't, don't say that, don't do that because they are afraid. I mean, there's an excuse about that. I mean, you see? Yeah. So this is the situation. But alhamdulillah, later on, step by step, I started uh, working in another way, not like uh, the, the old way of working and I found that the the social media is of, of uh, it's, it's a wide uh, path to use in Dawa in teaching in preaching and that we didn't have that before so that was very uh, that was very interesting and I started working on these things to, to be honest with you I didn't find any obstacles in my work i uh, alhamdulillah i find respect from everybody even uh the policemen in the street if i go if i want to go to the airport if, wherever i go i find people respecting me, alhamdulillah this gave me actually uh, a respected name you know sometimes and let me just be honest with you there, there's something very interesting when i was in in, in prison the people of prison the criminals who entered prison because of their crimes. They used to respect me in a way that is very, very, very strange. You mean, I mean, once, let me tell you the story. I found somebody crying, a young man. He was crying and shouting and whatever. I went to him and I, I started hu hugging him. I said to him, what's the matter with you? Why are you crying? He said, they accused me and they sentenced me by two years. I said, oh, come, come on, man. Why why are you crying about two years? What did you do? He said, I was accused to rape a girl. I said, okay, may Allah forgive you, but but I was sentenced by 20 years and I didn't cry and I didn't shout. He said, you are accused in the sake of Allah. And I was accused of raping. <laughs> <laughs> so they know that. They know that. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the same thing, actually. Uh, when you go, wherever you go, you find respect. Even the 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 I mean the the people of inside the prison. I mean the prisoners, not the prisoners. I mean the people, the jailers, the police of the prison, the jailers. Yeah, the jailers. They used to respect me a lot. Until now, when they find me, they respect me a lot. And I'm the last. That's from, that's from Allah's grace, actually. That's Allah's bounty, actually. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, mashallah. That's a very interesting time. Uh, I can't imagine it. So experiencing that. So may Allah protect us and save Amen. us from tyrants. But um, Amen. so um, 
you mentioned social media and you mentioned there are a lot of good aspects of social media. Uh, and I definitely want to get more of your insights on that. But before we talk about that specifically, one thing that has been on social media this past two weeks, and you've spoken very openly about it, is news in Afghanistan with the Taliban coming back and uh, basically uh, defeating the United States occupation. Um, so what are your views on this? What have you spoken about regarding this, especially given uh, you know, what you were saying when the invasion began. Um, what, what's been your experience? Well, um, uh, you know, we were, uh, we were put in a trail for this, uh, for this, uh, situation. And, uh, we started it from the beginning to the end. So the beginning is that, uh, United States made the same mistake of uh, uh, the Soviet Union and Soviet Union made the same mistake of the United Kingdom they went to a land that is called the 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 barrier or the the cemetery cemetery of uh, of emperors or empires uh, so anyone who wants to invade that land actually he gets uh, destroyed. This is what happened to all of these uh, all of these emper empires and in the end Afghanis say stay as they are and they gain victory on all of the enemies that they that tried to invade their lands. Uh, so we were as Muslims we were against invading an Islamic land. We were against that totally and we find found that that's uh, that's against the law, that's against the justice. And uh, many people in the world were against invading actually Afghans. We're not the only guy, the ones that were against that. Many people, many Muslims and many uh, just people in the world. I mean, we can't say only Muslims are just. There are lots of wise people in the West and in the East that are against abusing other nations, that are against uh, taking uh, a nation's property and stuff like that and killing people, innocent people. What did the United States do in, in Afghanistan? They killed a lot of innocent people that didn't do anything. I mean, throwing a bomb on uh, on students that are that are happy to graduate because they memorized the Holy Quran doesn't mean anything actually. Throwing a huge bomb on a hospital—it's a—it's a—it's a, a disaster, actually. It's a—it's a big crime, actually. Throwing bombs on innocent villages uh, and people who are uh, far from any 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 uh, any terrorist actions or whatever—it doesn't mean anything. So going to a, 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 a far land just to kill people there and to show that you're you're strong and you're a big country actually it's not fair it's not fair and this is what they just dis they discovered in the end after 20 years they discovered that they didn't have to do that although they say that we did we we, we did some good job according to them but actually when you see what happened in the end well nothing happened because taliban came again what's what what, what changed actually taliban that you you could have you could have sat down with them 20 years ago and told them please guys don't let any suicide bomb don't let any terrorist actions happen even from the beginning was against any act any uh, i mean the the leaders of taliban from the beginning were against anybody to a attack any country from their land so you could have sat down with them without killing all these people without losing all these uh, th these the guys from the two parts who would, who died thousands of people died from the two parts for what why did why did this happen actually you see yeah so so this is the situation actually yeah so what do you think is the significance of the u.s losing basically um the u.s being defeated in their attempt to occupation because a lot of people are looking at this I think a lot of people recognize, uh, like you said, people in the West included, non-Muslims in the West included, will recognize that this was unjust war, 
This has led to the deaths of countless people, um, and sometimes literally countless, because they wouldn't actually track how many civilians they were killing in Afghanistan. So they'll recognize all of that, and they'll denounce the invasion and the occupation. But other commenter, uh, commentators are, see it in a different light. They see it in the sense that, yes, this is a useless, terrible war, but this, rep this is symbolic. This is symbolic of the end of the U.S. influence in terms of military influence to impose militarily uh, Western values, specifically when it comes to liberalism, feminism, LGBT. Uh, this is the end of that era where the U.S. can just go to a Muslim country in order to spread freedom and democracy and, and nation build. And in fact, Biden, President Biden actually made remarks to that extent that this recently, this past week, that this is the end of the U.S. trying to nation build and spread values of uh, freedom and democracy and so forth. I mean, I think that's just lip service. I think they have many other ways of attempting to do that uh, through media, social media, NGOs and so forth. But a big component of the entire uh, reason for occupying and attacking Afghanistan was for women's rights. They're saying women are not going to school or learning to read and women are being abused and blah, blah, blah. All of these things that they say against the Taliban. Um, that was the excuse or the justification for the invasion. And there were, there were all kinds of reports about these gender programs that they're trying to start in Afghanistan, university programs. We want our, uh, these Afghan women to learn about gender fluidity and queer studies and all of this nonsense. And that failed. All, the, all of the, those things, alhamdulillah, are gone because the Taliban has stopped that. And you, on social media, can see on Twitter, some of these former uh, Afghan academics who are there as agents, basically, of the U.S. who exited, now complaining that, oh, all of our work has now been wiped away by the Taliban. Women are going to go back to being oppressed because they don't know about queer gender fluidity. Uh, so this, so these other commenters, sorry to speak so much, but they're saying that that kind of, you know, global homo, okay, globalized homosexuality, globalized homogeneity, of this Western liberal culture, this is a symbolic defeat for that. This is a symbolic defeat, and it's, it signals the end of this kind of cultural hegemony type of military influence of the US uh, across the world. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, and it, what is the greater significance for Muslims, for Muslims with this defeat? I believe, I believe, that uh, what happened in the world when the Western civilization uh, took place, the Western civilization actually is uh, a civilization that uh, appeared against religion because of the problem of the Western church, the Catholic church. So therefore they, they started the new civilization from the 16th, 17th century by being against religion. So that led them to escape from anything that has to do with scriptures, with holy books, with, uh, uh, with religious teachings. And that led them to, uh, between brackets, to worship the Satan. This worship, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't, don't worship the Satan. No, they started worshiping the Satan. They started following him in anything he says. Actually, they don't see him, but this is actually what happens. So, so homosexuality, uh, being atheist, uh, being against uh, feminism, all these, all these meanings, liberalism, all these things are actually worshiping desires, worshiping um, uh, the satanic teachings, worshipping anything that leads to destruction to the world. So the West destroyed its religion, Christianity, in its uh, false, uh, in its corrupted uh, uh, 
uh, is corrupted edition. And they try to preserve or conserve uh, Judaism, but in a way that it's just only in some some uh, in, in a way that they want to use Judaism to abuse uh, Muslims and to create a state in in Palestine so that they can benefit from it, or else they don't believe actually in Judaism or nor in other. Uh, scriptures or, or religions. And they found that Islam is the most strongest religion that stands in their face. How are they to, going to, to destroy it? They made their best to do all types of things to destroy it. Some of those were by invading some countries and forcing people to have these types of uh, beliefs to 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 plant these types of uh, uh, ideologies in Muslims' lands. They made a big mistake to do that in Afghanistan. Why? Because Afghanistan is still uh, a country that is not modernized in the Western way of modernized. They still respect uh, the tribe. The tribe there is very respected. And the leaders of tribe are still respected. And the leaders of religion are still respected, which are Muslims. So therefore, if few people follow them, the majority would follow them. And the majority would be totally against them. And this is what we saw. Now, Taliban, when they came back, they insisted on their beliefs. They said anything against the Islamic Sharia is rejected. We will, we Islam gave the rights to the women. We will give them the Islamic rights. They always speak inside Islam. And this doesn't suit the West, especially especially France and all these countries that are abusing Muslim women there. So therefore, there, therefore now, the Western new generation is finding that the West is hypocrite. West always claims that they have freedom of speech. But why are they abusing people who are against a lots of uh, things that uh, that are actually that are against religion. For example, homosexuality is against the religion. It's against the Bible and the Quran. The same. So actually, it's not it's not against Islam. It's against all of the religions which are actually have the same source. Uh, abusing Palestinians and supporting Israel Israel against them doesn't make any sense to people. Why should you go to a land? and invade it and kick its owners and uh, kill them and torture them and put them in jail and, kill, and scatter them in the world where you used to say and claim that you were abused by uh, the Holocaust and stuff like that. So now you're doing what you used to complain from. And that's why now we saw a lots of, um, pro, uh, a lots of uh, people who were against what happened in Palestine and Gaza uh, last uh, few months, and most of them weren't Muslims. Most of them were Americans uh, from all, all all types of backgrounds, which means that people now are starting to change and are starting to know that Muslims were abused and Muslims were treated unfree, uh, uh, treated uh, uh, un, un, not unfree, un, uh, unjust, uh, uh, fairly. They they weren't they weren't treated fairly. Yeah. So therefore, all of these meanings became, I mean, uh, uh, came just uh, words that don't have any any meaning, actually. To speak about freedom of speech and you abuse people, to speak about uh, women's rights, and you speak only about a type of woman, not all women. Now, when Muslim uh, girls or women in France are abused and they're not allowed to wear whatever they want, they're not allowed to follow their religion. What do you consider this? What does this mean? And when <clears throat> when the French, the French president uh, gives us himself the right to uh, uh, to make uh, car Prophet Sallallahu cartoons, and when people spoke about him, he said he he's gonna sue he's gonna sue them. He's gonna uh, he's gonna uh, he's gonna he's gonna he condemned that and he was against that. So he's respect him himself. And he's uh, people are not allowed to speak about him, but they're allowed to speak about Muslims' prophets. Salam alaikum.
So I think the Western, uh, uh, the Western uh, meanings, morals, and stuff like that are starting to dis to, to get destroyed, and many people are now finding that these uh, these meanings or morals or whatever are are nothing actually. Yeah. So, what I was you know, a little bit surprised about was the level of joy that I saw amongst Christians, Christian Americans, who are not necessarily the fans of Muslims. They're not fans of the Taliban. Uh, and some of them may have even supported uh, the U.S. invading Afghanistan 20 years ago. Some of them are even vets, uh, military vets who were in Afghanistan and killing Muslims. But now they're so happy that the Taliban won because they've woken up and they've realized this is Christians, hardcore Christian conservatives who are so happy and in favor of the Taliban against their own government because they feel that their government no longer cares about their interests, about human interests, and rather their governments have taken the cause of this globalized LGBT feminists ideology, this satanic ide ideology as you described it, and they are sick and tired of it, basically. They are sick and tired of this ideology controlling uh, their lives, controlling the lives of millions of people, billions of people around the world, and they saw the Taliban winning as a defeat for this satanic agenda. So even non-Muslims were very thrilled and overjoyed. Now, when, when it comes to the, the Taliban, a lot of Muslims are, are confused on this issue, and they are not sure whether they should be happy about the Taliban uh, being in control. Uh, so can you share some... Um, you know, advice on that, and how should Muslims around the world really understand? Well, I I believe that if uh, your brother takes place in anywhere in the world, you have to be happy, especially when he was uh, his country was invaded and he was abused and he was treated unfairly. So when he takes place and he uh, revenges and he uh, gains victory, of course you have to be happy. This is part of brotherhood. How can you say I'm a Muslim and you don't support your uh, your brothers in Islam? The Prophet ﷺ says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, And believers, men and female, are allies to each other. And the Prophet ﷺ says, He says that the Muslim, the believer to the, the other believer, are like a building. And he put he 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 connected his two hands to each other. So a Muslim has to always be connected to his brother, no matter what his brother uh, was. The Prophet says, "Support your brother, no matter he is fair or unfair." That does. They said, "Okay, he's unfair. We he's fair. We understand that. What about he is unfair? He says, stop him from doing bad things." But what did Taliban do? that is not good. Why shouldn't we support Taliban? What did they do? I just want to understand what is the big crime that they did? They are ruling their country by their beliefs and they have their culture. You can't implement your culture to their culture. The way they dress, that's their culture. The way the women there, that's their culture. They're not, a, I mean, they're not forcing women to wear a type of clothes that is their own clothes that they had hundreds of years ago maybe other muslims were influenced by the westerns and they changed their style of clo cl clothing or the style of uh, their women or whatever but that doesn't mean all muslims everywhere in the world should do that so when you go back and see what did these guys do and i'm i'm so surprised to 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 see that there are several muslims several Islamic groups or stuff like that, that they say, well, actually, we don't support Taliban. It's not up to you to support or not support. These are your brothers. Why shouldn't you support them? What do you want them to do? I mean, so actually, I'm so surprised. What do they want them to do so that they would support them? And the problem is that the, the same guys support secular people without any barriers, without any conditions. So when it comes to secular people, you support them and you claim that you're democratic, you're open-minded, and you don't say, well, actually, I don't agree with them in this and this. 
And when it comes to your brothers who follow Islam, who are uh, trying to be stuck to the text, who are trying to implement the Islamic law as it is, you start making uh, conditions and stuff like that. Actually, this is not, this is unfair. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this kind of hypocrisy that you're pointing out with a lot of the speakers and some of the imams of the West in the, in the U.S. in particular. Uh, they had nothing to say against the Islamic government uh, or the uh, Afghan government for 20 years. They had nothing to say exactly. on uh, the way that the government, the Afghani government, was implementing any law, any any policy. They were silent for 20 years, even though this government yes. was a sham government installed by the U.S. Uh, but they didn't say anything, and it's because many and of corrupted. Them, it, was corrupted. it was corrupted. Yeah. And, and the, I mean, even people now, even people now in the street in Kabul, they say, "Thanks God that these guys came." Those. The, the, the previous government used to, to take our money, to, to abuse us, to force us, to give them, to bribe them and stuff like that. So actually, there's a big difference, subhanAllah Adim. Yeah, so that in the U.S., the thing is that there are Afghans that are uh, diaspora, basically. They're in the U.S. and they're very wealthy and they are funding a lot of these imams, actually. Uh, to promote kind of a secular viewpoint and to oppose the Taliban. So th this kind of connection to rich Afghan secular types is not disclosed, but that's really what's in the background. That's why a lot of these speakers will not actually say something like you're saying, something openly, being happy, uh, supporting your brothers. Instead, all they have is complaints, criticism, oh, Taliban did this, oh, Taliban did that. But they were silent for 20 years. They didn't say anything about this corrupt uh, sham government that was ruling for 20 years uh, to serve the occupying U.S. forces. So this is a uh, big hypocrisy and subhanAllah, they, uh, they're not even ashamed to show how hypocritical they are. Yeah, now the, the strange thing, they keep on saying that these guys are bloody people. They didn't share any blood. They didn't kill anybody. They forgave everybody, even their great enemies. They sat down with them. They discussed with them. They said to everybody, just come back to your country. This is your country. I'm so surprised. What, what is the thing that you can blame these guys for? I mean, yeah. they treated people as, you know. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but just clarify for the audience. Do you share the same madhab as the Taliban? Yourself personally? No, I'm not Hanafi. Do you share the I'm not same, Hanafi. Do you share the same manhaj? Do you share, you know? No, no, no. Okay, so you're not But because they are my brothers. Of, yeah. No, no. <laughs> I'm saying this because they are Muslims and they are our brothers, but I'm not Hanafi. I'm not Maturidi. I'm not uh, Diobandi. But I, I respect any Muslim. And actually, I, uh, uh, I respect anybody who is just and honest and tries his best to support Islam, actually. And more than that, actually, I support anybody who is, you know, if somebody's not Muslim and he respects the morals and manners, I would, I would respect him, actually. Yeah, you'd respect it because he's doing good or he's being just. Those are, wherever those qualities mm -hmm. are, Muslims will respect that, of course. Exactly. Um, so I think that's important to clarify because people sometimes think that, oh, you only are saying this because you're part of that group. And no, 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 I'm not. not. Yeah, subhanAllah. So, um, kind of shifting gears now, more talking about social media as you brought up earlier. There's a lot of conflict and debate on social media. And one of the issues that people point out is that we have to spend a lot of time on social media uh, arguing uh, and doing dawah against you know, different non-Muslim factions, you know, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, all Muslims have to be united. And we shouldn't spend as much time uh, critiquing some of these Muslims that are reformists or they're introducing shubuhat or they're liberal, they're secular, they're feminist. Don't, we shouldn't criticize you know, these kinds of sellout scholars or uh, sellout imams. No, just ignore it because you're just causing fitna. This is creating fitna. 
let them do whatever they want to do and it's fine as long as we're united uh, we shouldn't do any kind of you know hispa basically between us uh, internally so do you agree with no you? that's uh, actually no i don't agree with that no i don't agree at, at all because it's like uh, if you have uh, if you have something uh, let me say uh, fruit that is rotten from inside and it's starting to the the rotten either you cut it and you use the part the the the, the good part of the fruit and it, you can eat it or else the whole fruit would get rotten and you'll throw it in the garbage so these types of people who claim that they are reformers and they want to reform islam these are more dangerous than the people who are outside of islam because these are inside the community these are according to a lot of people part of us and they keep on uh, they keep on uh they keep on taking people astray and i found a lot of people in in my life i know people who were who were who were preachers used to give juma speeches and stuff like that and all of a sudden they changed they flipped the prophet sallallahu told us this that means he told us that in the in the last days you're going to find people who who wake up as muslims and then they apostatize in the night or they become they they wake up as non-muslims and in the end of the day they become muslim so people change quickly and this is what what's happening nowadays you can find a shaykh or a da'i or whatever all of a sudden he he flips over he changes totally so it's our job to 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 uh, debate with these guys to show their mistakes to show their their the, that what they're saying is against the islamic teachings and i'm so proud of uh, many of your episodes and many of your uh, clips actually that you uh, you 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 talk against these types of things because the new generation needs this and they need youth young men um uh, who understand them and understand their mentality and to speak with them the language that they understand so um, actually this is very important according to what i see yeah it's um very concerning because you have these kinds of figures that they will dress you know as if they are very traditional scholars and they will claim that they have all of this ilm and that they have ijazat and the ulum uh, but then everything that they say, even to the, you know, lay person, the layman, it sounds like they're preaching Quran and Sunnah and Quran tradition. Allah. But really, Quran they have so much poison in their words because it's only supporting a kind of Western ideology. They are dressing up a Western ideology to give it the appearance of Islam. Uh, one of our uh, one of our scholars here in Morocco. And he was one of my friends. He wrote a book called Al Almanatu Min Al That means secularism from inside. That means these are making Muslims secular, but from inside, not from outside. It's internal secularism, if we can call it. So you can find them. Uh, their their image is uh, Muslim. They have a beard. Their wife wear hijab and stuff like that. But when you speak to them, you find them secular totally. They don't speak Islamic speaking. They speak as any secular person. SubhanAllah, yeah. It's a big problem. And I mean, with specifically with the Maliki Madhab, <laughs> will you find in mm. the West, because I think maybe most in the Muslim community in the West, they're not as familiar with the Maliki Madhab. They're more familiar with Hanafi Madhab or the Shafi'i Madhab. So you find some of uh, these kind of reformers uh, coming up mm -hmm. with all kinds of strange <laughs> shav views and they're saying, oh no, this is part of the Maliki Matab. <laughs> and they attribute it to that. So have you noticed this or seen this? Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. I noticed some of them, yeah. And I met some of them and I had a, a, a problem with some of them. So actually... <laughs> this is this works with ignorant people but when you go to the real malikis malikis were so strict and they were very harsh against any innovation and uh, they didn't uh, imam malik himself you know when the guy entered the masjid and he asked him he said 
how ar rahman ar arsh stawa the the uh, the merciful rose up the merciful rose up his throne how did he rise over his throne this is what he said how did he rise over his throne so imam malik was so upset and he started sweating and he put his head down and then all of a sudden he rose up his head and he said to him well rising up is is known literally it's something known and the way he rose up it's something unimaginable and you are an innovator kick him out of the masjid kick this guy out of the masjid just for asking so Malik was so strict yeah so Imam Malik was very strict in these things and his students century by century were very strict in these things so I, I get surprised when I see these types of people that claim that they're Maliki or actually they're not Malikis they're innovators actually Allah. yeah it's a it's a shocking a, using the tradition to destroy the tradition using these kinds of Islamic labels yeah. to confuse and distort the deen. It's uh, quite shocking. But um, any, do you have any uh, nasiha for people who want to study? Um, and I ask usually this question in uh, my interviews from scholars is, uh, you have Muslims who there is a lack of knowledge and they're confused about who is really a good source of knowledge. Uh, I believe that so-and-so speaker is genuine, but then I find out later that he's a liberal or he's a, you know, this dakhile, this almaniyun um, mm. that are secularists, but they're pretending like they're not. So yes. how, do you have any advice for how to navigate this and uh, what kind of decisions to make? To study deen more, basically. Mm -mm. Well, actually, the one who asks and searches, he would find, he would find uh, the scholar that uh, most uh, Muslim scholars in the world respect him, and uh, and uh, can say that this person is uh, a reliable person that you can take from him knowledge. Uh, it's not anybody just sits down and gives lectures. You can just go and take from us. So one of the Salaf used to say, I think Ibn Sirin used to say, This religion, this knowledge is religion. So search for the one that you would take your religion from. It's not just to take from anybody. Search. You have to search. You have to ask. And uh, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you. Because uh, whatever I say, in the end, actually, it's the guide, uh, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what I can say. Okay. Um, but there are some uh, institutes that are known that there are conservative, that respect the Islamic teachings as they are, that are against these reform, reform, reformings and stuff like that. And there are other institutes that are known as astray uh, or as uh, they don't give things as they are. Yeah, subhanAllah. So, um, do you also have any kind of well one thing that i want to ask you actually is what is really the biggest deviance in your opinion that's affecting muslims uh, maybe in the whole world but specifically also in the west because maybe if, if they're different um maybe we have different deviances or uh, shubuhat that are impacting the west versus the world what are your opinions on that well, actually, we have traditional deviance, and we have uh, new or uh, external or new types of deviance. The traditional deviance are those who have the old uh, sects, Islamic sects, between brackets, if we can say, uh, some sects that teach people to uh, that uh, to teach people to. A claim that all Muslims aren't Muslims. This is a problem, actually. Uh, teachings that claim that the Prophet's uh, companions, all of them apostatized, and uh, his wife is uh, is not a just woman, and etc. All teachings that teach people things like that. These are actually bad teachings. And we have others that teach them some silly and some silly acts, uh, like dancing and claiming that you're worshiping God by dancing, or by uh, things like that, you know? 
or that have some strange beliefs, believe that the you have to go to the shrines and worship people who are there and ask them and pray to them and etc. All these types of things that are totally against the teaching of the Holy Quran. And so these are actually, and there are some teaching that teach you to be always under the authority of any ruler, no matter who he is. And you are not allowed to um, to uh, not rebel, to advise publicly this ruler if he's wrong. And they are all against all, all Islamic groups. So they keep on... Uh, uh, insulting all Muslim scholars, all Islamic groups, and they're all against, totally against any Islamic movements. These are destroying the Islamic movements. Uh, so these are actually traditional, uh, uh, traditional. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, movements. We have the new types of movements, which are the, the people who want to modernize Islam, who claim that homosexuality is part of Islam, for example who claim that we are allowed to pray women and men with each other, who claim that a woman has, has the right to become an imam uh, and uh, lead pe people in prayer. All these types of new opinions that actually want to modernize Islam like they did in Christianity, like they did in Juda Judaism, and they created a new sect that is considered as modernized. They want to make the same thing in Islam. But that would be actually, but alhamdulillah, we still have scholars, we still have people who preach, who warn Muslims from all of these types of, of beliefs. And we have to carry on doing this. Like Imam Ahmad who said, The one that is that debates against the innovators, he's a type of struggler in the sake of Allah SWT. SubhanAllah. Yeah, I really liked that breakdown, the traditional kind of deviance and then the modernized deviance. That's a very, mashallah, helpful mm -hmm. way to think about it. Jazakallah khair. Um, so any other nasiha uh, that you can give to us, uh, the audience, um, for students of knowledge or non-students of knowledge? Uh, how can we really come closer to Allah? Um, any guidance that you can share with us? Well, I would like to uh, to advise my dear brothers and sisters in the West, especially, and in everywhere in the world, to uh, stick to the Holy Quran, to try to memorize it, to try to understand it, to try to benefit from it. Make uh, every day a portion of the Quran to read it and understand it and try to implement it in your life and teach it to your family. If you can make... Uh, a majlis of reciting Quran with your children, that'll be fantastic, actually. To be always stuck to the Quran. This is one. Number two is to always work on your hearts. Purify your heart. Work on your, your soul. Purify your soul to taste the beauty of Islam. And the third thing that I would like to advise my dear brothers and sisters is to preach, to grab people from the Satan and make them accompany us to go all under the uh, under our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to enter paradise. People would ask us in the judgment day and tell us, why didn't you guide us? Why didn't you show us the right path? There are lots of people until now that don't know anything about Islam and don't know anything about the truth. And when they get enlightened, they thank Allah, and you see, you see them how they shear tears when they embrace Islam. That which means they they tasted the the beauty of Islam. So actually, we have to work a lot. And I heard that there are thousands of people who embrace Islam, but they don't find people who teach them, who stand with them, who 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 keep who continue the path with them. So they get lost. Who's responsible for are these guys? We are all responsible for this. I would like to tell my dear brothers and sisters that this life is going to pass away. So don't lose a lot of time in this life and give a big time for your religion, for the hereafter. We're working and struggling in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a word. It's using uh, social media, using all these types of things. 
giving booklets, giving social, sending messages with your phone, see your friends, sharing all these types of things. It's very easy. But a lot of us, lots of us are still lazy. Many of us are lazy. They don't want, they, I mean, there's a lot of easy things to do, but actually we still don't do them. We still don't do those, those things. So actually I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to put us on the right path and to stand, uh, to stand with us and comfort us to stand firm on the right path until we meet him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We die as believers, as Muslims on the right path. Ya Rabbi Amin. Amin, Ya Rabbi Amin. Jazakumullah khayran, Ya Shaykh, um, for that beautiful, beautiful nasiha and everything that you've said. Um, any other um, uh, information about your academy? Uh, for our viewers who want to learn more, uh, maybe they want to pursue studies with you, please let them know how can they um, connect with your uh, institute and academy. Yeah, our institute, our academy is, uh, I gave it Ibn Abdul Barr Academy. Ibn Abdul Barr was a great Andalusian scholar. So, and he was a Sunni scholar who respects Sunnah and the, and he was a Maliki. But he was an Athari Maliki. That means he follows the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu And when it comes to the Maliki and the Prophet Sallallahu uh, authentic Sunnah, he would follow the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he's European because he's from Andalusia. So that's why I chose this name. So it, it enjoins all these meanings. Um, so uh, we try to teach in three stages. Uh, primarily and secondary and uh, last teachings, which would graduate, uh, 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 which the, the student would graduate as talibu ilm. But then he has to um, be specialized and learn Arabic and all these things. We don't teach Arabic, but we teach all these Islamic science from uh, uh, morals and manners, uh, cre Islamic creed, uh, jurisprudence, and uh, uh, prophet's uh, life and uh, all these types of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, we teach all those, and I'm the responsible of teaching all these things, alhamdulillah. Um, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, you can, we have a, we have a, a page on the Facebook and on, Twi on, on uh, Instagram, and on Instagram, and uh, I have several uh, lectures on my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in Arabic and in English, actually. So the students can benefit from that and can contact uh, us on our page. And uh, I mean, yeah, can benefit from from the lectures, inshallah. Okay, barakallahu feekum. Yeah, so to the audience, I'll include uh, links to all of these things, the YouTube channel, the academy and everything, and the social media pages in the description, inshallah. And again, I want to thank you, Sheikh, uh, from the bottom of my heart. You really have benefited <laughs> me and inspired me. Uh, with your <laughs> life and your story and your willingness to stand for the haq, for the truth at great cost to yourself, to your family. So this is what we need. This is the inspiration that Muslims all over the world need to understand that uh, Muslims can stand for the truth. And yes, it is difficult, no, but, no, no. but uh, the success is with Allah. So, barakallahu feekum, Shaykh. Uh, it was an inspiration for me, and I'm sure the audience will uh, love everything that you've shared. So, uh, thank you very much, and I hope that you speak thank you very more, much more in the future, and uh, have you on again to to speak with. Inshallah, us. inshallah. Okay. okay it was an honor for, for, and it was. I'm so happy to be uh, with you, and I would like to share with you another episode. Inshallah. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for everybody there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh.